ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯಕೃಪಾಸಿಂಧುಭ್ಯ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತಗತಾಧಾರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಿ ಗೌರಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ Today we begin the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita and this is often seen as one of the most relatable or relevant chapters of the Bhagavad Gita because of its depiction of human psychology and human nature which very much echoes what we see in today's society also. Now, before we go into the specifics of the chapter, let's see what is happening in the Gita. That the last section is the Jnana section. It begins with the 13th chapter where there are Arjuna's questions. And when Krishna is answering these questions, he focuses first in the 14th chapter on the concept of the Gunas. because they are a key component of the jnana world view which is what is being talked about so then in the 15th chapter there is a explanation of how krishna is the shelter or the and the goal goal of even the jnana world view so what krishna talks about that is described over here now in the 16th chapter why is this going on and off so in the 16th chapter that we will be discussing now the focus the focus is on describing human nature and the connection here with the previous chapter is that in the previous chapter there was a description of the tree the upside down tree now here there are the extremes of the tree we can see the tree extending the top of the tree and the bottom of the tree so if you consider it that means in this material world there are the the godly or those with the divine nature and there are the ungodly or those with the demoniac nature so broadly krishna is talking about in the previous chapter he has said that those who understand him and those who surrender to him they are enlightened and they will be successful in their endeavors so now krishna is building on okay what makes it conducive for some people to surrender so is there something so surrender will lead to success that was the theme of 1519 and 1520 so from that point now krishna is elaborating about the qualities or the nature that makes surrender easier 
और टफर सो दैट इज द ब्रॉड लिंक बिटवीन दीज टू चैप्टर्स वाइल एक्सप्लोरिंग द नेचर्स हियर द डिवाइन एंड द डिमोनिया नेचर्स Krishna describes the divine nature briefly. He takes only three verses. Use a list of virtues over there, but he finishes in three verses for one main reason. The reason being that he says, "Vistarasha prokto." He says, "I have described the divine qualities earlier." Now, earlier means if you consider sixteen chapter. One to three. That is a description of divine qualities. And then after that, there is an elaboration, especially from seven to twenty-four, which is the end of the chapter. There are demoniac qualities being described. It's not just qualities; it's also activities that are described over there. We'll see. It is largely about the demoniac nature. So Krishna says, "I talked about this earlier before. Now, where is this earlier? There are many places Krishna has talked about divine qualities. Right in the beginning, when he has described from fifty-five to seventy-two, two point fifty-five to seventy-two, he has talked about the characters of the sthita pragya, those who are enlightened. Then again, the twelfth chapter, thirteen to twenty, he has talked about the qualities that India is devoted to him." in the 13th chapter he has talked about 8 to 20 the virtues that make knowledge that comprise knowledge the virtues that make knowledge easier so these are all places where krishna has already talked about the qualities of the divine nature now exactly that's not the same term but the qualities are similar that and here a devotee to krishna but there are some smaller lists also at other places but these are three major lists so characteristics that comprise wisdom we discussed wisdom is that wisdom is not just a set of static data it is a set of dynamic virtues a uh, that enables us to discern is what really matters from what merely glitter glitters so to this is a separate reality from illusion that set of virtues that's what is called krishna calls us wisdom or knowledge so he has talked about these divine qualities before and after this he moves on to describing the demoniac qualities so he initially says arjuna there are these two qualities now what he does is in the fourth verse he just gives a brief description of the demoniac qualities and when he does that he says dambho darpo bhimanascha krodha parushyameva cha agyanam cha bijatasya partha sampadam asurim so he says dambho darpo abhimanascha now in one sense these three are they sound very similar but there are three shades of pride or ego so dambho darpo abhimanascha and we could go into technical differences of that but that's a different topic but krodha parushyame which are anger and harshness and then agyana ignorance cha abhijatasya is a path sampadam asurim so here the two significant points krishna uses the word sampada a sampada that me is using the word prakriti that nature what is it sampada is also all in nature sampada is some, sometimes connected with sampatti hmm? sampatti means what Position. wealth so what does this mean over here that these are the qualities that the demoniac consider valuable see krodha most people they 
are afraid of their anger. You know, if I get angry, I do terrible things. But there are some people who want others to be afraid of their anger. They are not afraid of their anger. For them, anger is a tool for intimidating and controlling others. And so they value, they see their anger as a source of their power. Similarly, they are harsh. Some people, they get pleasure in insulting others, in deriding others. And so that the, the sharper the insult, the cleverer I am, they think. So these are the people who they consider these kind of qualities to be a value, to be valuable. Sampada means that which is that which is valued. So it's their treasure. You remember earlier we discussed the difference between values and virtues that everybody has some values which is based on what they consider valuable. So when everybody has some values the problem is that some people what they value may actually be different from what is actually really valuable what is good to value so the demoniac their sampada itself is there's a huge mis mismatch between for the demoniac what is valued by them versus what is valuable there is not much intersection between them. They are almost separate. And for most people, there is this, you know, there is some degree of overlap. There is some degree of non-overlap also. Each one of us can think of things which we value that may not really be valued. So an alcoholic may value drink. But even an alcoholic, like I discussed earlier, somebody who wants to drink and party, they may value their the safety of their driving enough that I won't drive and drink. So what? how much is the mismatch? That is this question. So Krishna is talking about Sampada. And the other thing he says is Abhijatasya. Abhijatasya means born with. That we all are born with certain qualities. That means that the divine and demoniac are natures that a soul gets or rather the embodied soul, the soul is always pure and spiritual, the embodied soul, the soul in a particular body, it gets based on its previous lives. So these are, we, now we are born with them, that does not mean that we are bound to them. These are our starting points. But our starting points don't have to be our lifelong characteristics. That's like say all children, all newborn babies cry. And if they're hungry, they may cry a bit more. But there are some babies who cry as if they're going to bring the whole house down. So there is a bit more anger from their previous lives. So these are qualities which we all start with. And Krishna says, the key link between this and the previous chapter is Daivi Sampat Vimokshaya Nibandhaya Suri Mataha that If you want to get freed from the tree of material existence, the divine qualities help us become liberated. The demoniac qualities get us more entangled. I mean, Arjuna is hearing it, Arjuna becomes concerned. Hey, do I have demoniac qualities? Krishna says, no, your anger, he's thinking, I'm also, am I I'm fighting, that means I'm angry. Yes, but your anger is for the cause of dharma. Ma sampadam Don't worry, Arjuna, you are born of the divine nature. Then, Krishna starts describing the divine, the demoniac qualities. Now, let's see, this is often the term uses is, like the character portrayal. Portrayal means what? What is described about the character? So let's see how the character of the demoniac is portrayed by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. 
many times when we are talking about someone say uh, two people are talking and out of politeness or out of political correctness or out of just wanting to avoid unnecessary legal trouble sometimes two people may be talking about a third person but they just describe the characteristics of that person they don't mention the name of that person so now if others are also hearing everybody knows who is being talked about but you can't you can't say oh you mentioned this name because no main name was mentioned so like that when krishna is describing to arjuna the demoniac nature you know who do you think they are thinking about yes duryodhan so so duryodhan is not mentioned anywhere in this chapter anywhere in this chapter but especially from the verses 13 14 15 we will see the demoniac characteristics description so strikingly describes duryodhan's behavior so generally how does knowledge become relevant it becomes relevant when we are able to connect it with our previous knowledge or our previous experience otherwise it just doesn't uh, uh, um, it isn't it doesn't relate with us it doesn't connect with us so generally speaking the growth of knowledge is so basically the relationship between new knowledge and old knowledge now if there is too much new then it can be overwhelming because what happens oh i have to first understand what is being said over here i have to understand what is being said over here and then i have to connect both of them there's so much information that we feel overwhelmed by it but in that in what we learn if there is too little new then what happens it becomes boring yeah i've heard this also and i've heard that also and i've heard that also so if there is a healthy balance that means there is new knowledge being given but there is enough connection made or at least pointing done towards what we know previously then what happens is it becomes illuminating illuminating means how oh, yeah so it's not just that new knowledge gives us some new information but new knowledge also helps us to see our past experience in new light new non illuminating means in two ways it gives us mm, new vision or new light mm, but also it uh, it sees it's what you say it, it gives us just new information oh i didn't know this i didn't know this but it also gives us a new vision toward our old experience old information or old experience previous experience oh this was how it was okay and that's how it becomes illuminate So Krishna, when he was talking about the demoniac nature, he outlines the characteristics, and he starts with the behavioral characteristics, and then he will move towards from outside towards inside. That we, because we generally can't see people's minds, we can only see their actions. Now, of course, sometimes when people speak, also. their their thoughts their ideas their desires come out people can try to conceal what they think mm-hmm. but if we are going to stay with them for a good amount of time then it's difficult that's why nowadays podcast interviews are becoming popular because in the past there are media interviews could be scripted 3 minutes 5 minutes 10 minutes you interview a politician or some leader they can be given the questions in advance and they get prepared the answers in advance and come 
But if you have a one hour, two hour podcast, then it's going to be difficult, isn't it? How can somebody like maintain a facade for that long? <laughs> so, so therefore, it's a more authentic picture of who the person is. So similarly, it's we look at people's behavior, but if you are observing a consistent pattern of behavior, we observe people consistently, then their ideas, their thoughts, their desires, do they filter out through their words, through their actions. So like that, now Krishna describes the characteristics first. He starts with their behavior. There are many, many interesting verses, but we'll focus on some of them. The first he says about what is the behavior of that? That they just don't have a sense of boundaries. That is the defining characteristic behavior. I'll explain what it means. Pravritti and Nivritti. Now, Pravritti means that which is to be done. Nivritti means that which is not to be done. Jana, these people, na vidur, they don't know. Now, they don't know means, it's not that no one has told them, it is that they choose not to know, they choose to forget, they choose to neglect, they choose to reject. So, na vidur asuraha. These are the demoniac people. Pravrittincha nivrittincha. Pravrittincha nivrittincha. Janan vidura suraha. Janan vidura suraha. And what happens? In what sense are there no boundaries for them? Na shaucham. They are not very clean in their behavior, in their functioning. Na apichacharo. Even their overall behavior. When they get angry, their words are harsh. Overall behavior, they don't know boundaries. Na pi cha charo. And then cha acharo. It is achar. And na satyam. That there is truth. Te shuvidyate. It is not present in them. It's interesting, Krishna is not saying that they are not truthful. He is much stronger. He is saying truth doesn't exist in them. It's a very strong way of critiquing a person. Like if somebody asks, you know, one person gets and he says, are you questioning my integrity? No, I am just saying that it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so, na shaucham na pichacharo Na shaucham na pichacharo Na satyam te shubhidyate Na satyam te shubhidyate Together. So, the key characteristic is when they say Pravrittim cha nivrittim cha behavior is they know sense of boundaries. Now, say the male female attraction or sexual attraction is universal. Now, Ravan was bad, is considered demoniac, not just because he was attracted to female. It was rather he had no sense of boundaries. It was he tried to violate, he violated Rambhad, he tried to violate Devadavati, and then he abducted Sita. So it was not just lust, but Kamesha, Krodesha. Remember, we discussed what is the Krodha over there? The anger against boundaries. Why should there be any boundaries? If I have a desire, I can fulfill the desire whenever I want, however I want. Who are you to stop me? Who is society or culture or religion to impose any boundaries on me? So, there is no sense of boundaries. It's sense in the sense that there is no respect for boundaries. It's like some people don't have a sense means Maybe like a child may be innocent and a child may go to a neighbor's house and see some food on the table, just go and eat it. It is not my home, which has no sense. But it is, a child is innocent, a child is ignorant. But here they have no respect for boundaries. When you say no respect, what that means is they either forget, they neglect or they reject. 
somebody has taught them they never care to remember it we all learn things they don't consider important and they forget then they neglect the neglect means that even if they know it they don't care about it and then even if they, uh, they somebody reminds them about it they reject it they reject it so this is where often samskaras are important samskaras means impressions that are formed the samskaras can refer to two different things samskaras can refer to impressions and in this sense often it is used in negative sense we all have samskaras that we have to deal with we have impressions within us so this sense of samskara is we all have some scars <laughs> so so we all have some scars inside us some scars but then the word impressions have also as positive that is referring to ceremonies that create healthy impressions so for example there is vivaha samskara so when marriage happens at that time there is a elaborate ceremony there is a fire sacrifice there are mantras chanted there is a circumambulation in the western culture in christianity there is the taking of the vows so all that ceremony that is there that creates an impression every year we get some american people to come to india for a tour and these are american yoga students they go come to vrindavan and rishikesh they come to govardhan eco village and many of them are most of them are women so they want to not just explore bhakti and see holy places they want to explore india for them it's like a, a it's a tour it's a spiritual adventure but it's also material adventure so when we were in mumbai so many of some of these young women said we have heard about this big fat indian wedding you know indian weddings are supposed to be very big and i said we wanted to experience that so there was one congregation devotee who's daughter was getting married so they went there and then towards the end of the tour we asked all the participants what they liked some said that you know we we went to vrindavan and we liked the, the kusum sarovar i said have any of you been seen the kusum sarovar i said this kusum sarovar is actually more beautiful than the taj mahal so that was this, that was that some of their experience some of them said that we liked the went to rishikesh and saw the himalayas and the ganga before that was very beautiful so like that the difference is but several three of those young women they said that that wedding was very special then i asked them what did you like about the wedding they said, they said that it was so big like 900 people were there it was big. and he said we were there only for 4 hours but it was going to go for 3 days so i said okay we in india there is a sangeet and this and that all that is there so okay so what is so special about it apart from the size so or what, what is how did the size make it so special so she's the, she said you know, after attending a wedding like this you can never forget that you are married <laughs> <laughs> now we may say how can anyone forget that you are married is <laughs> it it's such a serious commitment but if people just go to a court and sign with two witnesses then and especially in a culture where you know uh, marriage is not a requirement for sex so people have had physical intimacy with many people and then it's like okay i'm married that's just an incident detail i don't know what it <laughs> so the samskaras yes sometimes the weddings in india can be just ostentatious that is just show of wealth and trying to show how wealthy i am and how my way my, my wedding or my child my daughter's wedding was bigger than your wedding all that ego com- ego competition can be there but beyond that all the ceremonies that are there they serve a purpose so the point is that one of the big responsibilities of both parents and society is to create a sense of boundaries in people as children are growing up it is one of the it is when we raise a child 
raising a child just doesn't mean educating the child it doesn't just mean feeding the child it means actually instilling a sense of boundaries or you could say again sense means i'm using respect for boundaries so that is a that is a responsibility of parents but it's also the responsibility of society it is the responsibility of culture now now some people may not accept boundaries in spite of having all these things that's that's unfortunate that's also their misguided choices that it could be their uh, demonic mentality coming out from previous lives but this is the broad responsibility of society there are always be bad people doing bad things and good people doing good things but overall at least society should be creating impressions so that people know what is good and what is bad and that is in done through set of to giving boundaries so the demoniac they just don't accept any sense of boundaries now krishna goes further and krishna is outlining the demoniac demoni demoniac nature first he is talking about behavior there is no sense of boundaries and then he says where does it come from that is where he talks about atheism he says asatyam apratishthamte asatyam apratishthamte so now these are krishna is using different adjectives and his or different describers and these are referring to this not necessarily to one world view different people have can, can have different world views but the sense of no boundaries can come from people who consider this world only to be false asatyam this world is false then the whole idea of boundaries also is false why care for it and some rest people say okay asatyam apratishtham yeah this world may be real but there is no foundation to it there is nothing substantial real beyond it so the idea here is that even if there there are some there is a morality they say it's more all morality is just relative it's if you think that is right for you that's right for you if you think that is wrong and that is wrong and ultimately it goes down to jagat ahur this world is they say anishwaram anishwaram means what no god no god ishwar is god there's no ishwar in control and then where does it come from they say a paraspara sambhutam it is simply by the contact of one being with another it is simply the male female contact the sexual contact kimanyat kama haitukam what other purpose is there then the fulfillment of desire that this world has begun with the desire and what purpose there can be for it other than the gratifying of desire so jagat ahuranishwaram jagat ahuranishwaram अपरस्पर संभूत अपरस्पर संभूत किम काम हेतुकिस्ट्रस मेन्टालिटी इन जनरल फॉर एनी सोसायटी टू फंक्शन देर हैव टू बी बाउंड्रीज ना वी मे से in the western world people are materialistic people are sensual all that is true but one the reason why western society has progressed to whatever extent it has progressed that is the economy direction is people at least with respect to finances have a healthy sense of boundaries now when people say that okay i will do this job by this time they will do that job by this time see when the whole e-commerce started say at that time somebody could have advertised a product on the internet and then uh, that product could have been a substandard product and at that time laws were not properly formulated and say what could have happened is a person pays and somebody else could have just let uh, given a substandard product or somebody could have sent a product and somebody could have sent the other buyer could have sent a bounce check so 
it was that the whole e-commerce, which has now become a major part of commerce, with the pandemic, it was through online shopping, only things continued. It all began and it all sustained because there is a basic level of trustworthiness. There's no society can function even at a material level without trustworthiness. So, so with respect to, you could say, sexual morality, often the Eastern world is has a healthier sense of boundaries in the Western world. Mm -hmm. But with respect to economic morality, often the Western world has a healthier sense of boundaries than the Eastern world. Now, corruption is the norm in the Eastern world. And it's not just India. And there's a reason for it. It's not historically these countries have been poorer. And that's why the idea is that anywhere you can get money, you should just get money. So, again, I'm only talking about general characters. This is not absolute. There is corruption at a big level in America. In the, way, in the sense that various levels, especially the military industrial complex is there. Where the country even starts wars just so that their weapon manufacturers can make more money by selling weapons. So it's quite brutal. It's not, not nowhere is, I'm not saying that people are good entirely everywhere, but a broader sense. Like say in, Amer in America, when we distribute books, you know, we don't ask for money. Just give a book, not just in America, in the entire Western world. When we distribute books, just give money and then, so how much is this? It's just whatever you like you can give. And people look at the size of the book. And if you give them Bhagavad Gita, they will give $5, $7, $10. So one of my friends, he says, mm, if somebody asks, he distributes books, he says, so, uh, how much is this? He says that some good people, they gave me $5. Some bad people give me $10. <laughs> and he says, I'm a very bad person, I'll give $20. <laughs> so the point is, that in India, if we tell someone, you give a book, whatever you want, you can give. <laughs> <laughs> they will not even give a thank you. <laughs> and they'll just take the book and go away. <laughs> so, the point is that, that to whatever extent there has been progress in the West, that it is because there is some respect for boundaries. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Every culture has its uh, has its uh, strengths and its weaknesses. So, kim anyat kam hai to kam. When one thinks that desire is the only basis for existence, then one then it becomes okay. If I have to fulfill my desire, and something is an obstacle, then why should I care for that obstacle? If some society has some boundaries, why should I care for those boundaries? So basically what happens is atheism. Now asatyam apatishtham te jagat ahur anishwaram. So asatyam, these are three different philosophies. Asatyam is nihilism. Nihilism means that this world itself is not here. There is no meaning to anything at all. Apratishtham. Mm -hmm. That is materialism. That this world is real. Nihilism is nothing is real. Prabhupada mm -hmm. Pantahur is voidism. And so materialism is only this world is real. That means the world has no foundation. So asatyam apratishtam. That this world is there. But there is no foundation to it. There is no other reality beyond this. Almost all the major traditions of the world in the East or the West, they had an understanding that this world is, is just a temporary journey place for us. There is another world which is more enduring. That is where we are meant to go. But materialism is that there is no foundation beyond this world. And atheism is Anishwaram. That there is no God. Hmm. So now what happens while each of these are different in their own ways but all of them are in one sense conducive to the rejection of boundaries. I am not saying they cause 
they are conducive to why conducive to because if there is no regulating principle if there is no higher purpose if there is no accountability then if i have power and if somebody has something that i want i can just go and take it from them and who is there to stop it what right does that person have to stop it so there is when the idea is that there is no nothing higher then if i can get higher than you i become the highest and then i can just reject all boundaries so can atheists be good people can materialists be good people can nihilists be good people they all can be good people but if they are good people it is not because of their philosophical world view it is in spite of their world maybe it's because of their upbringing because of their past samskaras so krishna says that these world views and next verse is etam drushtim avashtabhya nashtatmano alpa buddhaya these is a very really destructive world views very very destructive world views and kim anyat kama haitukam the sex has always been a part of human society but you know there is sex as a part of human culture and there is a sexualization of culture sexualization of culture means sex gets permeated into every aspect of culture so one is we can see it in the media you can see it in the advertising but that is only explicit there is even at a intellectual level in the 1950s and from 1920s onwards roughly in in america and europe there was what was called as the sexual revolution what is the sexual revolution there was a thinker called sigmund freud have you heard of this name sigmund freud so many people say that freud it sounds very similar to fraud <laughs> <laughs> so now he was a brilliant thinker in his own way but he was monstrously misdirected so <laughs> so what happened was as materialism was spreading he started seeing that you know more and more people are mentally disturbed more and more people are facing uh, facing uh, troubles at the level of the mind and he came up with his own theory about why these problems are there so apparently in his childhood he had some kind of sexual attraction towards his mother <coughs> and of course because of uh, social social and culture he writes about it in his books also to some extent that because of social culture and social convention he couldn't act on it so he generalized and he said that all boys have sexual attraction towards their mothers and all girls have sexual attraction towards their fathers and he called this the oedipus complex and i think the viagra complex something like that so and he said because society prevents us from acting on these natural urges because it is natural he says so what happens is that repression leads to a lot of frustration and that frustration is the cause of mental disturbance and so he said therefore if you want to be free from mental disturbance what should be done all restraints on our natural urges should be removed and as from that time onwards even in the west like you know when we say the west is materialistic if you go backwards uh, even if you see say any western movies about 100 years before or something like that society was quite conservative the way men and women would interact would be very regulated but from the time of sexual revolution which started primarily from his teachings he was in the 1920s but it went on 1940 1950s it became huge so their idea became that any kind of sexual restriction is the cause of all problems 
and li being liberated means we should be free that we have the right to act on our sexuality the way we want and no one has the right to stop that so the say the respect for marriage as the basis for sexual engagement that was there in the west but after now always there are people who will have affairs and things like that that's there but there's one thing which happens at the fringes of society and it's another which becomes mainstream and accepted in the mainstream of society. Like say, now in India, uh, many places, limited relationships have become very common. And there are movies in Bollywood which talk about this. And they talk about it not in a critical way. They talk about it as if the people who are opposing it are critical. They're criticizing those people who oppose it as old-fashioned. So what happened, the sexual revolution meant that it was basically any kind of regulation on sex, that is to be rejected. And that led to a catastrophe. Now multiple strands of thought came together. It was a, it is 1950s, 1960s of time when Prabhupada went to America. That was a time of big tumult in America. So what happens was, there are three things. It's like sometimes you know, three disasters can hit at the same time. One was the intellectual. At an intellectual level, what happened was the Freud's ideas led to the that oh, all sexual restraint is wrong. Then there was the technological. The technological level, what happened was contraception came in the form of the birth control pill. They call it now the birth pill. So prior to this, women at least women would be restrained in offering themselves to men because there's always the risk that you'll become pregnant and then you have to be at that and in the past at least there was this level of decency in the west they had this state this this thing called shotgun wedding and what is a shotgun wedding that means if a unmarried boy and a woman boy and a girl they have some they do something and the girl becomes pregnant pregnant then the girl's father comes with a shotgun get married to her otherwise i'll shoot you so many weddings will be shotgun weddings, <laughs> shotgun at the edge of a gun. So, but at least what happened by that was that people would take responsibility. But once the birth control pill started coming up and abortion became easier, then what happened was through technology, the natural restraint, the biological restraint that was on sexuality, that was removed. So, it becomes the woman should take a birth control pill before uh, so that she doesn't get pregnant. Anyone anyway, get rid of it. It became so nonchalant. So, now it's like in the West it has become such a, it could say almost a darkly demoniac thing that even 15 years ago or 10 years ago when Bill Clinton was the president, he said that we want abortion to be lay, safe, legal, safe and rare. That was 10 15 years ago, but now, now the mainstream idea in the West is that abortion is a natural right of a woman. And they say, Nietzsche Prabhupada would say that you know, if a man and a woman unite, then the woman becomes pregnant, and then she has to be at the responsibility, she has to go, go and beg from the state uh, for support. So, so and therefore, is it there has to be regulation? Women should regulate, men should regulate. But the modern ideology is that, or we could call it postmodern or whatever ideology, they say nature is so unfair to women that nature has allowed men to have sex without any accountability or responsibility, but nature doesn't allow women to do that. And therefore they say, there's, it's a slogan, pregnancy is biological slavery, abortion is technological liberation. Can you imagine the perversity of this mentality? And on Instagram and Facebook, now it is like we share our stories of how we came to Krishna consciousness. There, there, is, there are memes which say, share your abortion story. It's like nothing to be ashamed of, you be proud of it. So, there is, there is, there is on one side the intellectual, there is a the technological and there is a the cultural shift. Cultural shift means what happened was, what was considered, uh, what was considered in the past, uh, uh, 
something to be ashamed of, something to be hidden. Now it is something to be proud of, something to talk in the matter of rights. And that's why in the West, if anybody criticizes abortion, it's like, you know, abortion should not be done. The immediate response is, how can you hate women like this? So any statement critical of women, of abortion is seen as a, as a trampling on women's reproductive rights. That's the terminology, reproductive rights. So this threefold thing, it has made, it has created immense sociological devastation. And because of that, the family structure has, as Prabhupada talks in this 16th chapter purpose, and Prabhupada is prescient, he's writing it in the 1960s. He says the family is almost an imagination. So it is happening. It is that, you know, mar uh, marriages don't last and children grow up without uh, a proper family and it's a horrendous situation to be in. So this, uh, when the sex is a natural part of human, human life, it's a natural part of marriage also. But when sex becomes the purpose of life, then marriage just becomes an unnecessary entanglement. If you can have sex without marriage, then why? And then what about children? You know, why do you need <coughs> children at all? Children are just an uh, obstacle to enjoyment. So it's, it's a social, it, it leads to a sociological disaster. So all three of this come together, it leads to a sociological disaster. So what Krishna says, Etam drishti mavishtabhya nashtatmanu alpabuddhya prabhavanti ugra karmana kshayaya jagato ahitaha. So he says that's what this was. Etam drishti, this, all these world views, if somebody accepts it, avishtabhya, if somebody accepts this, then what happens? First of all, nashtatman. They are destroying their soul. So if you see in all this, there is no idea of spirituality or spiritual restraint at all. Nashtatman. So the soul is gone long. Even this world is gone. Leave alone the other world. Nashtatmano alpa buddhaya. It is very meager intelligence. People have intelligence, but they misuse it for rationalizing their own ideas. Prabhavanti ugra karmana. Such people flourish in terrible activities. Ugra karmana. Now there was a, there's a journal of medical ethics in which two philosophers, because they're philosophers, they published an article which they said that a woman should have the right to abort a child even after he's born. Now when it was, it was published four or five years ago, and it created a furor. Now, what kind of monster would, uh, would even suggest an idea? See, the baby is newborn. Even the hardest of people, they soften up, isn't it? When somebody sees a baby, they smile, they cheer, they make faces, they fondle the baby. So the babies, babies are so innocent and helpless that they naturally bring out the warm protector in people. The warm caregiver, lover, lover, not in sexual sense, but in a warm uh, caregiving sense. That comes out. But so who would think of killing a baby who's born? But these two authors of this paper, they said that you know, all this anger is just sentimental. It says from the perspective of science, the there is no difference between the being when it is inside the womb and when it is outside the womb. <coughs> so if you can kill, if you can terminate it, in, if the woman has the right to terminate inside the womb, then what is going to stop it from terminating outside the womb? Now, can you just call this sentimental? Actually, it's not sentimental. There are certain sentiments which actually protect our humanity. So, if there is there is outrage, outrage means or indignancy, something terribly wrong is happening. So, if a small kid is being bullied and some people passes by and they feel, you know, they see that bully, how they get feel angry? How dare you bully this person like this? If you don't feel anger at that time, 
then there's something wrong with you. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you go and beat up the bully. What we have to do is, as we thought out carefully. But sometimes emotions, they point to our humanity. So, the, so what happens is once you start going towards the whole idea of rights and rights alone. Now, of course, till now, in no country, this, has been, this proposal has been accepted. <coughs> but what has been done, see, sometimes abortion fails. What do you mean abortion fails? And when there is an embryo in the womb, they try to kill it, but it doesn't die. And what happens? It comes out of them. And it's alive. So there are several states in America which have legalized the killing of the baby after it comes out. So it's, it's like they say abortion goes wrong, it's like so the murder plan goes wrong. Then you can still murder. So it's horrendous. So Unfortunately, uh, abortion is not a big issue in India because in India still people are control, concerned about, poly, po, uh, about population control. But abortion is a big thing. It's huge in India. We have a devotee hospital, the Bhaktivedanta Hospital where in Mumbai. So there we strictly don't do abortion and we also say any of the gynecologists who are there. Uh, you cannot do abortion in any other hospital also. Either somebody comes to you and then they come to you they, if you say, okay, you know, here I don't do abortion, but you come to that hospital. Then basically the same thing will go on. So I was talking with a devoted doctor. He says that actually just by this, like my salary has gone down to one third of what I would have. Can you imagine that means those who are meant to deliver children, two third of their salary comes from not delivering children, but destroying children. So it's a, it's a terrible place to be in. In, in, that, uh, in today's world, at least from that perspective. So, Prabhavanti Ugra Karmana. Ugra Karmana is deadly work. Shayaya Jagato Rekha. Shayaya, it's destroying the world. It's horrible, it's unbeneficial. So, Prabhupada talks about weapons of mass destruction like nuclear weapons and others. That's very overt, but at a covert, at a subtle level. It's like a train wreck. In India, we just see the glamorization of it all. Oh, it's, there's so much, uh, so much enjoyment available. But that enjoyment, it, it is not just, a, it is not just a enjoyment. There is a lot that is going to follow after that. Krishna says that which tastes like nectar in the beginning will taste like poison in the end. So. These demoniac ideas, demoniac worldviews and the consequences are very much evident in today's world. Almost in, in America, uh, one out of every four fat children is born in, in a broken family. Mm -hmm. And especially in black families, it's one out of two. More than that also. And that is not counting all the children who were killed. And all the abortions that happened. Now, of course, there is uh, no easy solution to this. Mm. There are some countries which try to make abortion illegal. But all that happens by that is the women try to do abortion on themselves, on themselves privately. And then <coughs> it ends up leading to, leading to sometimes they're getting seriously injured. they hurting themselves. Sometimes they die also. So, it's not just imposition of a law that's going to solve the problem. It has to be a rehauling, a rethinking of the entire value system and the social structure system. So the, the demoniac ideas, they, they are quite destructive. There are multiple verses which goes on. Now, Chintam Aparimeyam Cha. Chintam Aparimeyam Cha. That means what? Chinta. Now, anxiety is there for everyone in life. Life is uncertain, that's why there is anxiety. But here they are talking about immeasurable anxiety. Chintam aparimeyam pralayantam upashita Till the moment of death. Till the moment of destruction. Here means death. So they, are, they have embraced these anxieties. Upashita means they have taken shelter of these anxieties. It's a little bit of a sarcastic kind of usage. Who will take shelter of anxiety? But they have unwittingly taken shelter of such anxieties. 
सो चिन सो अप्रलयांता मुपाशिता सो कामोप भोग परमावाय काम उपभोग दैट बिकॉज़ दे हैव डिसाइडेड दैट सेंस प्लेजर सेंशुअल एन्जॉयमेंट नॉट ओनली इज इट अ पार्ट ऑफ लाइफ परमा इट इज अ मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट ऑफ लाइफ एतावद इति निश्चित they are completely convinced about it the one problem with the world is that the wise are full of doubts and the foolish are full of confidence <laughs> <laughs> that means that when we are practicing bhakti you know oh, does krishna really exist will krishna krishna actually help me will this krishna consciousness actually purify me of my desires will this actually make me happy we have so many doubts But the foolish, <coughs> materialistic people are fully convinced. You know, if I just get this sense gratification, I will be happy. There is no doubt at all. That is, they are nishchita. They are convinced about it. If I just get this money, if I just get this, if I get that, there is no doubt at all. So now, what happens? While well, the certainty is there, but it is also anxiety. So I was saying, anxiety is always a part of life. Mm-hmm. Anxiety is always a part of life, but there is circumstantial anxiety, and there is existential anxiety. That anxiety can be circumstantial means that okay, something has gone wrong, that's why I'm anxious. This is circumstantial anxiety. So if we have to catch a train. I'm not sure if we are going to reach in time for the train or not. Then there is an anxiety, but there is existential anxiety. Existential anxiety means that at every moment in life, there is our very existence. There is insecurity. There is uncertainty. So, you now when and for example, now in some countries in the West, it's easier to get a divorce. then it is to end your phone contract with the company for the service <laughs> that is it if you have taken a phone service for 3 months if you take off you won't get the refund there are some stakes over there but in the west there is something called no fault divorce no fault divorce means more people say you know i don't blame the other person i don't blame the other person we just don't get along so we don't divorce so it's like There are some places, not many, in the rest of time, fully virtual. It's like you can just decide today and tomorrow you're divorced. It is so casual. Most countries they at least say that you have three months, six months waiting period. But there is this exist. So you know, it's like people imagine if a child wakes up, one day it wakes up and I don't know whether tomorrow morning when I wake up, one day the child sees the parents are quarrelling, and that night the child is worried. Are my parents going to divorce themselves? In whose home am I going to stay? Where am I going to stay? Can you imagine the amount of insecurity the child will have if they're living like that? And what happens is children often take things into their own. If the parents are upset, they are like, "I did something wrong. Maybe because of me, my parents are quarrelling. Because of me, the parents are going away." So that's it. That is existential anxiety. Now this is the children are not into sense gratification, but is that? because but the fallout they are like the casualties they are the victims of this so like there's so much anxiety it's sometimes some people live tottering on the edges of breaking down externally they may look very very functional and even attractive but inside there is so much insecurity eating up a person as one of my american friend he told me he is a devotee preacher he said one of the persons who was cultivating whom i was cultivating he sent me a message early morning please accept my final obeisances i do <laughs> so he said i immediately called him asked him what happened And I try to pacify him. <laughs> so it's a 
even for many people ending their life has become like almost a casual thing of course nobody takes it casually but it is the gravity of things there's so much anxiety something goes wrong that's what is the point of living so this is the chinta the level of anxiety is enormous and of course you can see there are many causes for this and so the economic factors the whatever factors they can be considered but at a foundational level we need a certain foundation for our life we don't have that if whatever world view is there whatever culture is there that starts eroding that world view then it is utterly disastrous so now what is further he says this is so much chinta and kamo pa bhoga parama that the desires are the prominent in their life they decide a sense pleasure is the prime purpose of life now what happens by this asha paash desire becomes like a shackle paash shatair baddha hundreds so people become bound by hundreds of desires asha paash shatair baddha asha paash shatair baddha kaam krodh that is and desire and anger parayana the scripture says we should be narayan parayana we should be dedicated to narayan but people are dedicated to fulfilling their desire and anybody who doesn't fulfill my desire i will destroy that person their kama krodh parayana and then what happens ihante kama bhogartham for the purpose of fulfilling desires kama bhog arth what to do अन्यायेन अर्थ संचय बाय अन्याय अन्याय मीन्स अनजस्ट और अनफेयर बाय इमोरल मीन्स दे स्टार्ट फुलफिलिंग दे स्टार्ट गेटिंग वेल्थ अर्थ संचय सो द वर्ड अर्थ देर आर द अर्थ कम्स ट्वाइस हेयर भोग आर्थम एंड अन्यायेन अर्थ संचय सो भोग आर्थम सो अर्थ कैन मीन पर्पज अर्थ कैन ऑल्सो मीन वेल्थ so for the purpose of getting pleasure they start getting wealth by illegal means by immoral means so so here krishna is going back to the starting point where it says then at pravrttim cha nivrttim cha janana vidurasura that the defining characteristic of the demoniac is not that they have desires but their desires don't know boundaries so what happens is once they have desire the desire becomes very strong <laughs> Asha Pash. So, a nowadays in today's world, if you can say slavery is condemned. Yes, there is sometimes still slavery is there secretly, especially human trafficking and sexual slavery is still there, unfortunately, or industry. But still, overall, slavery is condemned. But there is there is there is physical slavery that is not there. But there is psychological slavery. psychological slavery is basically because of so it is relatively ready reduced physical slavery but psychological slave is widespread psychological slavery basically it's addiction there's so many different kinds of addictions and more and more forms of addictions are coming up so hmm addictions can be to objects that is like a drug addiction or that can be uh, alcohol addiction but addiction can also be to activities like there is shopaholism hmm? shop 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 till you drop okay, the people just can't stop shopping people have their homes filled with junk and now especially with amazon available you don't even have to go to shop to shop isn't it it's uh, you just can shop online so people often have just so much stuff filled with uh, so so they just bought and they don't know what to do it so it can be to objects and can work all is that's also a form of mm, and it can also be to particular results that people seek let me say gambling now it's gambling can be done through cards 
gambling can be done through dice gambling can be done through sports gambling can be done through apps which have games whatever you want to say so the idea is that there the focus is not on the particular activity in that sense it's the particular result i want to earn money and it's often not even that these people who gamble they need money there's a they want the thrill and so it's 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 utterly asha pamsha shatair banta ha so the shackle of desire shackles of desires they are what cause psychological sleep and these are invisible see if somebody is physically tied with ropes then what happens is they try to go somewhere they just can't go because the ropes are pulling them back so now we may not have any physical ropes binding us but there are so many things which we want to do but constructive things valuable things but these shackles of desires just stop us just pull us and we just can't do those things so these are not like prisoners chains if they are prisoners chains they make us immobile they don't allow us to the shackle of desires are like puppeteer strings they make these make us super mobile the puppet it moves us fast this way this way this way so when people are bound by desires they become energetic so krishna uses the word moodha and krishna also uses the word vimudha vimudha means empowered fool <laughs> <laughs> empowered what does empowered mean in this context that actually they are empowered in the sense they are, they are empowered by their destructive desires they are, they have extremely high level of energy for trying to fulfill their desires so for example somebody gets into drugs mm-hmm. now initially they get drugs and they just okay i want to have some fun i want to feel high i feel good but afterwards the craving increases craving increases and drugs don't come cheap then you start lying when you start stealing when you start attacking people to get money and they slowly are descent into crime so many people who get into crime it's not because they had criminal tendencies it's just that they got addicted and the desire became so bad that there's no way to fulfill it and they get into drugs so all this is a dangerous trap and the more we are aware of it the more we can actually not only protect ourselves from it but be grateful that we are protected from it so krishna consciousness you can say seriousness in krishna consciousness it can come in two ways one is by understanding understanding how wonderful krishna is or rather more specifically krishna is always wonderful but how wonderful connection with krishna is how much how wonderful when we get connect with krishna that is but simultaneously the second is to understand how dreadful disconnection from krishna is from krishna we can say can be it doesn't have to be because in the materialistic world there are people living in sattva guna and there are people living in rajo guna people are living in tamo guna now this sattva rajas tamas it has always been there throughout history but the problem is in today's world for somebody to go from sattva to rajas to tamas is extremely easy <coughs> like say somebody is studying in a library i mean they want to watch a movie they have to come out of the library and go to a movie theater they have to they have to take drugs they have to actually come out and find some place where there's a joint and they get some drugs over there they want to go to a bar so it's like sattva rajas tamas but quite well separated and it required some effort to go from sattva to rajas to tamas but in kali yuga you can be at one moment surfing in like wikipedia and reading something valuable next moment we go to some netflix and start watching some movie and next moment somebody can goes to some porn site 
It's like within one minute, one can go from Satvarajas to Tamas. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so, while this, while this, uh, uh, the Satvarajas Tamas is always there, the degradation is very easy. So, you could say in the past, Satvarajas Tamas was, the degradation was gradual. So, in the past, the physical nature of society, physical nature of society, it made that a person could go from Sattva to Rajas to Tamas. But in Kali Yuga, it, like, it is almost like instantaneous. Like from Sattva to Rajas to Tamas. So, it's like the technological changes. They made it so easy for people to just go to Tamas. Mm -hmm. So now we move forward and this Asha Pasha, this, this jackal of desire can be extremely dangerous. What is now, I said that all this is, till now I had described about how this reflects contemporary human psychology. Human society and human psychology. But now we can let's go to the Mahabharata's context. So, what is Arjuna, what is Krishna telling over here? So, Idam Adhyamaya Labdham. So, this much I have attained. And Imam Prapse Manoratham. This much more I will get. Manoratham. Sitting on the chariot of my mind, I will run here, I will go there. And get it. That means I'll make schemes, I'll make plans, I'll get more. What is this? Idam asti idam apime. Idam asti idam apime. This much I have got. So it can refer to wealth, it can refer to property, it can refer to prestige. All this much I have got, this much I get more. Bhavishyati punardhanam. Bhavishyati punardhanam. In the future, I'll get much more. So now, this is typical human greed. It, it may not be a good thing, but it's widespread, it's understandable. Everybody wants more money in life. And everybody makes schemes, okay, I've invested here, I may invest there, I can do this, I can do that. So this is, in general, we could say it's normal. Not desirable necessarily, not laudable, but it's normal. But from here, everybody may have a desire for money, but the characteristic of the demoniac is that, how far will they go to get money? So what do they do? Next one is question. Asau maya hatha shatru. Asau maya hatha shatru. This enemy I have killed. Hanishye chaparanapi. Hanishye chaparanapi. That one I will kill in the future. Hmm? Ishvaro aham aham bhogi. Ishvaro aham aham bhogi. I am the controller, I am the enjoyer. Siddho aham balwan sukhi. Siddho aham balwan sukhi. I am perfect. I am powerful. I am happy. So, in one sense, the first verse could be describing a businessman, a software engineer, a corporate executive. And you know, I have this much money, I'll get more money. But the next verse is describing an underworld dawn. <laughs> <laughs> this much, this much, this enemy I have killed, and that enemy I'll kill in the future. So, the problem is that with respect to the demoniac, they have no boundaries for their desires. And this was Duryodhan. That Duryodhan, sometimes people, some people say that actually Duryodhan was a good person, Shakuni made him bad. Well, that is a bad inference. <laughs> Why? Because Duryodhan came up with the idea of killing Bhima without any suggestion from Shakuni. Shakuni was not in the picture at that time. And can you imagine? These are just teenagers at that time. And he is organizing an entire party. And he's telling, you know, Bhima, you and I, we had some tension in the past. I want to catch up with you. So, I have made a special feast for you today. And now, when Bhima is strong, he has lived in the forest. He has lived among sages who have been virtuous. 
he has he has of course fought against dangerous animals but dangerous animals like lions and tigers in the forest they are dangerous but they are not deceptive okay, they come to attack they just come to attack mm -hmm. but he here duryodhan is dangerous and deceptive so he makes a whole scheme that just i want the kingdom and i want the pandavas out of the way so asomaya atash this enemy i have killed that enemy i will kill in the future and sometimes we try to do something wrong and it doesn't work and our conscience says you know maybe this is not meant to be i should not be doing something like this but for duryodhan what happened one bad thing didn't work then he tried a far worse bad thing what was the next thing sorry yeah he tried to burn all the pandavas not just first one now all of them and not just all the pandavas the pandavas and their mother but their mother had never harmed them in any way and this shows that this is see even in even even in mm, greed or even in violence there are certain limits that even in the past when wars would happen there would be a basic understanding that civilians should not be harmed when with alexander uh, when alexander came to india uh, one of his people came with his megasthenes megasthenes wrote a book called indica and he says that what struck us and he had come with alexander and they went they got to conquer the entire world he said oh, in the entire world what struck us in india was that how oh, that immense care was taken to never let civilians be harmed in war that war should happen in such a way that like the kurukshetra war it's happening at a particular place both sides have decided so war is almost like a sports match or it's brutal people are going to die but the idea is a sports match happens at a particular place at a particular time and say if that a test match morning time till evening time then next day so it was it was like that so in that culture for duryodhan to make a scheme to even kill kunti it's horrendous so the demoniac are defined by their rejection of boundaries how far can a person go every one of us has anger every one of us has lust every one of us may have greed jealousy whatever but how far do we go everybody gets angry some people when they get angry uh, they may raise their voice but still they may raise their voice but they will not speak foul words they will not utter profanities some people they get angry and they don't raise their voice but they speak horrifying words some people do not just stop at horrifying words they they raise their fists and hit someone some people don't just raise their fists they look for some knives to hit someone <laughs> mm -hmm. some people they get angry and they look for a gun mm -hmm. some people they get angry and they look for a bomb isn't it so anger is there but all anger is not the same why because that person how far are their boundaries for regulation of anger so the presence of anger itself does not make a person demoniac rather anger that rejects boundaries that's what makes it demoniac and the what is the last point is ishvaro ham aham bhogi sindho am balwan the key point is sukhi that a person who harms others and does not feel bad about it see when duryodhan tried to kill bhima and it failed or when duryodhan tried to burn the pandavas and it failed do you think he regretted it of course he regretted it he regretted that his plan was not successful <laughs> <laughs> so for him the idea was that if i succeed i'm happy just see how clever i am sukhi so that is the most dangerous thing that we have. now where do the sense of boundaries come from that our bond i said that everybody has anger say now if you consider five people have anger their anger's boundary is 
just a loud voice. But that is person one. Person two, their anger boundary is they utter foul, swear words. It's not just loud voice, but swear words also with it. A third person, their anger boundary is that they use fists. They hit someone. A fourth person, their anger boundary is that Hmm. They, yeah. the fifth person, third, fourth, fifth person, they will take out not just, they will take out a knife, and like that it can go on. Hmm. This go on. So there are people who can even do genocide. Genocide means one person from that community hurt me, I destroy the entire community. So that is horrendous. So the anger is there in everyone, but it's boundaries that matter. And now, where do the boundaries come from? The boundaries broadly come from two sources. One is intelligence, and the other is conscience. Intelligence and conscience. So everybody may do wrong. So just doing something wrong does not make a person a bad person. It is how do they reform after, what, what do they do after doing something wrong? That is the key thing. So intelligence is more based on reason, logic. Conscience is based on emotion. You just feel bad on doing something bad. So for the demoniac, what happens is, for the demoniac, their conscience is deadened. That's why they don't feel bad. In fact, they feel good. Like this is where in today's world we have psychopaths and sociopaths. They do horrendous, horrendous things and they just don't feel bad about it. In the demoniac, the conscience is deadened and often their intelligence is not deadened. It's not destroyed. It's distorted. Distorted means it is misused. Normally, we should use our intelligence to restrain our anger. But they use their intelligence to direct their anger in a very cold and clinical way. And this is where things can become very dangerous. So for all of us, as we are practicing bhakti, say when we decide to follow the four regulatory principles, what are we doing? We are voluntarily choosing some boundaries. And by that, we all may have certain desires. We all may have certain cravings, certain conditions. We voluntarily accept some boundaries. What are we doing by that? We are ensuring that these dark desires that might be there within us, they don't take us over. They don't take us over the line or they don't they take over and control us completely. So that's why boundaries are important. Now, can boundaries be restrictive? Can boundaries be arbitrary? That's possible. That's why so boundaries have to come from Shastra. They have to be based on scripture. Now, Krishna will go on and say that, Yajante Nama Yagyas. You see, the next thing is that here, when the demoniac, they are not just so, see, the stereotype idea of a demon might be, you know, that person looks like a very scary, horrible person. Mm -hmm. But some of the demoniac people, they may look like very attractive, gentle and a nice person. Mm -hmm. So, some villains, they look like villains. Some villains look like heroes. <laughs> Isn't it? So, here, we is talking about the demoniac people who don't want to look demoniac. Adhyo Abhijanva Nasvi Adhyo Abhijanva Nasvi That means I will surround, surround myself with I, I, I will surround myself with elite people I want to belong to the elite club, crowd So when I belong to the elite crowd then what happens is that means I hobnob with them I am a good person, I am a great person in fact So Konyosti Sadrusho Maya. Who is there as good as me? Who is there like me? I am the greatest. 
It's like basically they have got the God complex. I'm God. But, you know, okay, now I got power, I got, I got people around me, but I now want prestige. And the last prestige they want. They think I am God, but I also want to look good in people's eyes. So, Yakshe Dasyami Modisha. Yakshe Dasyami Modisha. So, Yakshe means I will do Yagyu. Dasyami means I will give charity. Modisha. In that way, I will enjoy the reputation of being such a good person. So, Krishna, the next verse is Yajante. Then the two verses later says, <coughs> Yajante Nama Yagyanste. They don't do yajna of na, they do yajna for na. <laughs> they do yajna for the purpose of getting prestige, name, reputation. And this is, uh, so Krishna says, Itya Agyana Vimohitaha. Such are the people who are completely deluded by ignorance. Agyana Vimohitaha. And then Krishna later on will go on and say that how such people are bound to they are living in a hellish way and they will go to hell because of this. So, now if you see, in these verses, nowhere is Krishna emphasizing that they are not devoted to me. That is of course implicit. But that is not the emphasis of Krishna. Krishna is saying that in our tradition, broadly speaking, see hell is talked about in various traditions. But if you talk about hell, hmm. in the Abrahamic religions, Abrahamic means Judaism, Christianity, that is for non-believers. If you don't believe in God, you are going to go to hell. In the Vedic tradition, it is for wrongdoers. It is not that just because you don't believe in God, you have to go to hell. You may not believe in God, but if you are living sattvi, sattvically, you will get elevated. In Rajasthan, you will stay. In Rajoga, you will stay here. It's behavioral. So, hell is not a punishment for believing the wrong things. Hell is a punishment for doing the wrong things. That's one difference. The other difference in the Vedic and the Abrahamic tradition is that there often hell is eternal. In our tradition, hell is temporary. It may exist for a long time, but it is not forever. Nothing except, Prabhupada was asked, is hell eternal? Prabhupada said, nothing except ecstatic devotional service to Krishna is eternal. Mm -hmm. Everything else is temporary. So, Krishna, and so, these people may go to hell, but from there also they can be delivered. So, when Krishna speaks over here, he is speaking out of parental concerns. Why are they being so terrible? That he says that those people go to hell. He says, he doesn't, want, he doesn't want them to go to hell. So, in our Vedic tradition, how it is God... He doesn't, doesn't, what God does is, does God send people to hell? Well, no. Rather, God goes with people to hell. What does it mean? He, even, in the, even in hell, the Lord is present as the Paramatma. So, people are getting the consequence of their actions, but God never abandons them. God never forsakes them. So that is the that is the love of Krishna for everyone. And then after that, Krishna will talk about how this all is okay, he's talking about they're going to go to hell. How does one know what are the major things that take one to hell? And Krishna talks about the well-known verse. Look at it. That there are three gates to hell. Trividham narkasyedam. Trividham narkasyedam. So, narkasya means to hell. Idam, from here, there are three kinds of. Dwaram nashanam atmanaha. Dwaram nashanam atmanaha. These are doors that will destroy the soul. Kamaha krodhas tatha lobhas. Kamaha krodhas tatha lobhas. So, he names the three of them. Tasmat etat trayam tyachet. Tasmat etat trayam tyachet. Therefore, 
these three should be given up. That's interesting Krishna uses the word Nashanamatmana. In the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, 17th verse, Krishna says, Avinashi Tutadriti, the Atma can never be destroyed. So, how can he say Nashanamatmana? This is clearly non literal. When he's saying the soul is destroyed, that means a spiritual inclination, the spiritual propensity of the soul gets destroyed. The more somebody is filled with lust, anger, or greed, then they just can't think of anything higher in their lives. They can't pursue, even perceive anything spiritual. So that's how the spiritual propensity is destroyed. Now if you consider <coughs> most of the problems in the world, even at a material level, they come from these three things. Lust, anger, greed. So much of violence it arises from primary anger. There can be many causes of violence, but it generally arises from anger. Most of the corruption arises from the greed. Most sexual assaults, they arise from lust. So if you consider, these are the three main categories of crimes in the world. So the three anarthas are not just obstacles on the spiritual path. They are also obstacles for social harmony. They are obstacles for functioning in this world also. This is, therefore, Arjuna said, we should, Krishna tells Arjuna, we should give them up. And he says, if you give them up, not only will we be saved from hell, but he says, we can become elevated and eventually liberated. But unfortunately, the demoniac, they, they reject Shastra. And Krishna finally will conclude by saying, Therefore, one should follow Shastra. Now, when you say Shastra, the word Shastra can at one level mean scripture, which is of course true, but Shastra is that which does Shasan, that which gives some regulation. So, if Krishna says Shastra Smart, uh, let's, that's the last verse in this chapter. Tasmat Shastram Pramanam Te Tasmat Shastram Pramanam Te So with the Praman, Praman means the source of knowledge. By using Shastra as a source of knowledge, Karya Karya Vyavasthita Karya Karya Vyavasthita That understand the boundaries, Karya and Akarya. What is to be done, what is not to be done, understand the boundaries systematically. Then, Gyatva Shastra Vidhanoktam. Gyatva Shastra Vidhanoktam. In this way, when you come to know about what Shastra has taught, then Karma Kartum, then you can act, you can make proper choices. Iharasi, that is what behooves you, Arjuna. Karma Kartum Iharasi. Karma Kartum Iharasi. So, by studying scripture, there are many things in scripture. If somebody can um, read some stories from the Purana, Ramayana, Mahabharata, and that's all nice. But if we want Shastra to bring a change in our life, we should let Shastra give us a sense of boundaries. And when we have those boundaries, then now do all the scriptural boundaries apply exactly in the same form today? Maybe not. But once we understand the principle of boundaries, then we understand the principle, we will be able to apply it in our situations, in today's world. So, how exactly will it apply in today's world? That is something which the living tradition tells us, that's our own religious way of doing this. But scripture, when it gives us a sense of boundaries and we accept that sense, then we stay protected from lust, anger, greed and which is inside us and then society stays protected if more and more people keep themselves, keep the lust anger with, within themselves and don't let it come out. Prabhupada says that everybody in the world wants peace but there can be no, there is no use, Prabhupada says there is no use crying for world peace unless there is an awakening of divine consciousness within the individual. It has to change, has to begin from within. 
So in the world, there are so many terrible things happening. And the starting when I spoke today about the kind of sociological havoc that is going on. We may shudder, or we may even feel helpless. But what we understand is that each one of us, to the extent we try to purify ourselves, we try to discipline ourselves, we try to bring about our higher nature, then we can be a part of the solution. Now, how much of a solution we will be a part of, that we don't know. That the future will determine. That depends on how much our abilities are, how much our dedication is, how much our how much Krishna can empower us. But each one, but the whole, but each one of us can be a part of the solution. And if we just focus on trying to regulate the lower nature within us, the demoniac side within us, and activate the divine side within us, the divine nature within us. And every one of us can see each person, if they can, the divine side, they activate it. And the demoniac side, they deactivate or decrease it. And they can be a part of the solution. And now how big a part that at this point we can't say. Why? Because we don't know that we don't know how much abilities we have. We, we have some abilities, but we don't know. Then, not only about abilities that we have, eventually, each one of us may get into particular roles and situations in societies. And those places, we may have, say, if today, one, if say tomorrow one of you becomes, uh, you can become a spiritual teacher, you can become a brahmachari, you can become a, uh, respect, a respected member in society. So, we don't know what roles Krishna will have for us in the future. And we all, the important thing is that if we just try to bring out our higher nature right now, then Krishna can use us more and more in the future. So, we don't know what abilities we have. We don't know what roles we will play in the future. And we don't know what empowerment we will get in the future. But the point is, these three things, abilities, roles and empowerment. Each one of us, how big a part we can play in solving the problems in the world, discovering that, how big this discovery could be actually our life's biggest adventure. Each of us can be a part of the solution and how big a part how much good we can become, how much good Krishna can do through us. Discovering that can be our life's greatest adventure. So ultimately Krishna is calling us, every one of us, when he says, yeah, the archer of these reishtas, each one of us to set a good example. That means each of us try to bring out our higher nature and each one of us can become a part of the solution. So I'll summarize. What we discussed today. Broadly speaking, we discussed an overview of the 16th chapter, and within that, I started by discussing about how, why is Krishna discussing the 16th chapter. He said in the 15th chapter, surrender. And then he will talk about the starting point for surrender. That some people may have favorable qualities and some people may have unfavorable qualities for surrender. And this um, comes from one's previous life. So we are born with these qualities. But just because we are born does not mean we are bound to them. We can change them. And Krishna, says, Krishna keeps a description of divine qualities brief because it has been it is repeated earlier. And he'll focus on the demoniac most of the time in chapter. And among the demoniac qualities, we discuss the, the first characteristic is no boundaries. They have 
no sense of boundary, there are no respect for boundary, they forget, reject, <coughs> neglect boundaries. And this sense of no boundaries, you could say this is behavior. But underlying the behavior is often ideological. The ideological, we discuss three ideologies which can lead to the destruction of boundaries. One is nihilism. Nihilism is nothing is meaningful. This world itself is false. Then materialism. That is asatyam apratishtam. There is no foundation to this world. And then anishwaram, atheism. All of these can lead to person, okay, if there's nothing higher, why do I have to follow boundaries at all? So this was 16.7 and this is 16.8. And then we discuss the destructiveness of that when Kimanyat kama hai to come, that kama hai to come, that when lust becomes the or the sexual gratification becomes the purpose of life, how it can lead to uh, utter destruction. So I talk about the sociological collapse and chaos, disaster that has come about in the, the 20th and 21st centuries. In the 20th century it came to the West. 21st it will come to India. So we discuss three factors. There's an intellectual that was the ideas of people like Freud on sexual liberation. That all problems on the mental level come because of because people have repressed sexual cravings. So you should just reject all boundaries. Then coupling the intellectual was technological. Technological means Nature had created the natural boundaries, but those boundaries were removed through the birth control pills that's before the sexual act and abortion is after the sexual act. So by that there is no limit and then after that there is, there is cultural. Cultural means that what was in, in the past, like in the past abortion was something, you know, it is not something to be it is something done secretly, something to be ashamed of. But now it's become something to be what people were ashamed of. Now they are, let's say, you are proud of. So this complete distortion of social values has created devastating consequences in the society. And then we discussed about based on sixteen point eleven. Chintam aparimeyam cha. How there can be anxiety that is circumstantial and that has always been their part of history, but now there is existential anxiety that because of which people can commit suicide at a trivial thing, they can just end a marriage on the trivial reasons. So people live in great insecurity. And then we also discuss that that how asha paashtaivadha that there is psychological slavery in the form of addiction and these are like a puppeteer strings the puppeteer strings mean because they don't make us immobile they make us super mobile so we don't realize that we are bound but still we are bound and it is a deadly situation so eventually what happens is that when desires become addictive, the result of that, it is when the desires become addictive, then morals, what happens? Morals become rejected, they become dispensable. Because for gaining money, I'm fulfilling my desires, I'll do anything. And that we discussed Duryodhan's character is being described in especially 16, 16, 13 to 15. So from being greedy to being murderous. So everybody has greed, but being murderous is ghastly. So that was Duryodhan's nature. And then after that, they also make a show of piety. So that they can get even the prestige that religious people get. So I want to be religious and get the profit that comes from religiosity. 
by show of piety what I do? I get the prestige. Yajante nama yajna is there. Their yajna is just for nama, for show. And then we discussed about how such people go to hell. But we discussed how hell is temporary and hell is for wrongdoers. It is not for non-believers. So in our tradition, even hell is ultimately a place where God is there with us. God has not abandoned us. And lastly, we discussed how at an individual level, each one of us individually, if we accept boundaries in our life as taught by Shastra, then what happens? We can, we can increase our higher nature or our divine nature by that our divine nature will become improved and our demoniac side, whatever it is, will get decreased. And then each one of us can do good. How much? That we don't know. But discovering that, what abilities we will get, what roles we can play, what empowerment we might get in those roles. Based on that, each one of us can actually this Discovering that can be our life's greatest adventure. And it is this adventure that Krishna Consciousness calls each one of us to. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. Prabhuji, uh, we know that Krishna has given us free will and then he lets us fulfill our desires and also that he is the, our ultimate benefactor like he uh, loves us, cares for us but isn't there like a limit to how much uh, free will uh, one can have like there is just, isn't it too much evil uh, we have also discussed and uh, it's uh, just a, 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 like a father if he does allow some uh, wrong doing, but to a certain limit only. If it goes beyond that, then it becomes like it's forcefully stopping it. So why isn't like this uh, doing it, Krishna? Like why does he allow so much evil? Well, there are natural limits which Krishna has put. One of them is Kaliya lifespan is decreased. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if somebody like Hitler or Lenin or Stalin had lived for ten thousand years. <laughs> oh, how much damage could they have caused? So, there are natural limits. One is the lifespan itself, through death. But then, there are natural limits to evil. That people can do, human can do. Even humans do. So, one is lifespan. A person can do that, but not for too long. And in general, <coughs> What happens is, uh, it's very rare in the history of the world that there will be, really, oh, there's never, not near, rarely is there only one autocrat <coughs> or one powerful person. There might be one powerful person, but there are other powerful people also. They may not be nobly motivated, always. They may not be as bad as the other person, they may not be extremely good also, but there, so it is one person's power is checked by other people's power. So, in that sense, there is a Bhutana, Myantha, people fight among each other. But through that fighting also, in one sense, that one person's rise to absolute power is minimized. But still, the question does come why is so much evil allowed? That's what we will discuss in the ninth chapter, which is I think we are going to discuss day after tomorrow in the morning. See, basically, but briefly to answer is that everybody in their past has done some karma, and by that karma they get some kshetra, and within that kshetra, what they do is up to them. So it's like a son has acted trustworthy. And it's got a good amount of wealth. Maybe the parents have given it and trusted it to them. It's for business purpose only. 
but the parents are interested there. Now the son can go and um, can drink and <coughs> squander the money in destructive activities. When the parents are interested in the money based on the past track record. <coughs> so generally, anybody who gains power in this world, that means they had done some good karma in the past. So Hitler had the karma to become a powerful leader. But unfortunately, he chose to become a powerful but dreadful leader. That's why when Hanuman saw Ravan for the first time, for the second time, First he saw him when he was sleeping in the in his home when Hanuman was searching for Sita. But second time he saw him in his court. At that time he saw him in his regal splendor. The first thought that Hanuman had, oh, this is such a powerful person. If only he had been virtuous, he would have been a protector of the gods. So that's unfortunately there that if somebody has good karma from the past and they have capacities now then if they misuse it it's tragic but if Krishna intervenes when somebody has that karma credits of good karma then again he's interfering inordinately in this world of course beyond that we have the principle of avatars where Krishna comes again and again now avatars is not only he himself coming sometimes he sends this Personally, he comes, sometimes he sends his representatives also. So, rather than be waiting for why is Krishna not doing anything, we, teach, we, we need to see what can I do to make my corner of the world better. Thank you. Yes. Where is the mic? Yeah. We should create bound, boundaries around us. Yes. So, when we live in devotee circles, so their boundaries are more coincide. Like we uh, impose a four devotee principles such as everyone should follow and everyone should eat prasadam. So, when these boundaries are coincide, then the impurities in our heart came out, come out, comes out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, typically a person may be very well respected outside in the material world, but when in devotee circle, he may be like judged sometimes that yeah, if this person is just this impurity in his heart and he has envy in his heart. So in our devotee circle, so uh, this may like uh, feel like um, the same case will be there that people will be envious towards each other. And so how can we deal with this? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It's Prabhupada says in general standard one. He said, Prabhupada, the standards are for raising ourselves, not pushing others down. Mm -hmm. Whatever standards we talk about, it is, okay, this is where I want to go. That you are not here, you are a terrible person. It shouldn't be for pushing people down. It should be for judging ourselves, not judging others so much. Now, of course, a part of being in a community and having guidance means then we others who will see us in particular ways. And we can't help that. <clears throat> so what we need to do is, rather than thinking of the community as only one, one set, we can find out within the community people who are like-minded. Even among spiritual teachers, not everybody is exactly the same. Even among spiritual guides, even among senior devotees, among our equals, not everybody is the same. So there will be some who will value us, somebody, some who will devalue us. If you can find out those who value us, those who understand us, and connect with them more. So from their association, we get some strength. And those who are judging us, those who are because of their envy and all this is there, that's just a part because that's a part of life. Because although we are devotees and we're pursuing a spiritual purpose, but still we are in the material world and we still all have material conditionings. We're trying to work on it. So, so we need to have the strength to deal with this kind of judgment. So basically, if you see, it's a spectrum of devotees. Spectrum means a range of devotees. So among this devotee circle, some 
their association will give us strength. And even some devotees, their association will require strength. And it's fair enough. In the people of the association require strength, they're not bad people. Sometimes their insistence on standards, they're reminded of standards, is what will help us to grow. But if that is the only kind of people that are around us, that will be difficult. Hmm? So we need people who accept us. See, in, generally for our growth, this is a broader principle, that hmm, for growth, we need people who are accepting us and we need people who are expecting from us. If there is only accepting, then there will be stagnation. I, I saw one t-shirt where the person says, in the Japan in America, he says, I am perfect as I am. Well, you can say, I am good as I am, I am valued as I am, I am valuable as I am, but I am perfect. There is no room for improvement, isn't it? That will lead to, so if there is only acceptance, that will lead to stagnation. But if there is only expecting, that will lead to suffocation. Like everybody says, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. You know, you're good as you are. So we need an association that is a balance of both. Balance. We need some people. So those who give strength are those people who are accepting. Those who require strength are the people who are expecting from us. And through both, we grow gradually. Krishna Prabhu, in the 19th verse, Krishna says that uh, those who are envious and mischievous who are the lowest among men are perpetually cast into the ocean. Okay. Yeah, so in this chapter, there's a lot of non literal usage. That particular usage, it is uh, that he says, uh, it seems that he is saying, talking about eternal hell. But if you look at many other places in the Bhagavad Gita, we look at the context. So, for example, Krishna says that. Everyone can be elevated. Anybody who's apichetasi pape bhya sarve bhya paka bhaktama sarvam jnana plave naiva vrijanam santarishyasi. In 436-437, Krishna says that no matter however how sinful a person might be, if they become situated in the boat of knowledge, they can be elevated. So if somebody is going to go to hell forever, how can they be elevated? And Krishna says that by his bhakti, everyone again can be elevated. So the idea is that this is more an expression of anger than an expression of fact. It's like a, because in this chapter especially, like I give the example of um, this Annashana Matmana. It's not a literal thing. The soul cannot be literally destroyed. There are at least three or four places in this chapter where Krishna clearly uses non-literal. Um, Krishna is using Krishna, a lot of places Krishna is using non-literal. So this particular uh, usage is also non-literal because we have to consider the chapter and the mood in which it is spoken. So it's like a parent may say to a child, if you do this, there will be no place for you in my house. The point there is not get out of my house. The point is don't do this. Isn't it? So it's more an expression of concern or anger than rather a uh, statement of like uh, condemnation of permanent judgment. Hare Krishna. Roji, you uh, told about that there are three gates to hell, last time there three. And uh, after hearing this pro from Krishna, Arjuna, when his son Abhimanyu was killed, was he did he was he over he he was overcame by anger and he took a haste vow to kill him. So how it can be explained? Because first he received that knowledge and just see just because we have spiritual knowledge, our spirituality is meant to add to our humanity. It is not meant to delete our humanity. <laughs> if somebody's son is killed. This natural level of human emotions are going to be there. 
it's it's not that we are we are not meant to have our humanity. Isn't it? This is if philosophy starts taking away our humanity, it's a very dangerous thing. Like some people say, okay, you know, everybody suffering because of their past karma. Well, then where do you stop? Is it sure doctor say to a patient who has come, you are suffering because of your past karma? <laughs> <laughs> a newborn baby is crying. Should the mother say the baby is crying because of past karma? <laughs> is it it? So, you know, no philosophy, spirituality, it should take away our humanity. So, it's, there's a natural human bond is there. And there will be natural loss over there. Now, did Arjuna get angry? Yes, but in his anger, he did not do anything adharmic. His service to Krishna increased. How? Because his anger was not directed towards Yudhishthir. You, know, you didn't, you didn't, you send my son into the war. I will kill you. He understood that the Kau they that the Kauravas are the evil people, and among them, Jayadrath had acted in a way that. The plans that the Pandavas had made, Pandavas had a plan that Yadhavani will make the Chakra view and thereafter uh, they will go in and they will destroy the Chakra view from inside. It was a reasonable plan. But Jayadrath thwarted it. Therefore, Krishna Arjuna decided, I will kill Jayadrath. So, was it out of anger? Yes. But was it anger adharmic? No, it has to be seen from the perspective of what does the result. That anger was directed against somebody who was supporting Adharma, somebody who was on the side of Adharma and the Kauravas suffered probably the most uh, devastating defeat on that day both in terms of the number of soldiers who were killed but also in terms of morale like in terms of the uh, like say optics optics means what say if two teams are batting and the two teams are supposed to be equal. But the other team comes, first team has a, makes a score and the second team comes. And one batsman just fight from the beginning to the end, he bats and you know, the opposite team is not able to take even one wicket. So it's not just a defeat, it's a, like a thrashing. So from the optics perspective, what happened for the cover was that our entire army can't pro can't stop one opposing warrior. So what hope is there for us to win? So it was just the morale was destroyed after that day. So it was a great victory actually. So we should not uh, we should not in any way uh, reject the natural occurrence of human emotions. Human emotions are not to be suppressed. It is that we understand that Krishna is there and the soul is eternal, but still, that person whom we had loved and cared for has gone away now. And if, even if we had loved that person as a part of Krishna, but still that person is not there with us now. And that is going to create a hole in the heart. So, th that grief needs to be healed. In the first canto of the Bhagavatam, it is said that after the war got over, the Pandavas performed the last rites of all the all those who killed the war and then they grieved the loss. So we should we should not lament, but grieving is a natural part of healing. And grieving is necessary. It's just as the body is there, it's a reality, the mind is also a reality. So just as the body can get wounded. I mean I understand I'm not the body, but if my hand is fractured, I can't just go about functioning normally. I have to wait for the hand to heal. So similarly, when we lose a loved one, our mind gets wounded. Now, I am not the mind even if I know it. But still, my mind is wounded. It will take some time to heal. And that healing process is what grieving is meant to assist in that. But uh, earlier we saw, Prabhuji, like you told that it is not necessary to suppress human emotions. <laughs> So, but earlier uh, Krishna told Arjuna that you should not fight for revenge. But it is natural human instinct to fight for revenge in that case because they have done something wrong. See, 
just because something is a natural human emotion does not necessarily make it good. The, the basis of everything natural is not good. The male female attraction is natural. Isn't it? It has completely come from nature. It is not only natural, you could say it is necessary for reproduction. But still that doesn't mean every occurrence of that attraction and the emotion therein is good. So just even when there is natural, we have to use our intelligence and conscience to discern what is taking us toward good and what is taking us away from good. So there has to be, so the defining criteria is will this emotion uplift me, will it take me towards dharma, will it take me towards Krishna or will it take me away from Krishna, away from that. Thank you. Last question. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. Vitae Gaur Primanande.